please? Hi. This is Matt Hill. This is the voice of Matt Hill. Oh, and... and the voice of Matt Hill. Oh, well, thank God. Very distinctly different voices. Makes life easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to congratulate you guys on Resistance 1942. This is a hell of a film. I'm a glutton for all, all films, World War II, World War I, especially films that tackle issues like this, but do it without hitting anybody over the head, shoving anything down anyone's throat. The way you have constructed this film is so observational. You make great use of montage. Your lighting is what you use to do a lot of the tonal shifts that we see. And you let us feel with this film. You're not bashing us over the head with exposition. Your imagery, the dissolves uh, as transitions, that's your exposition. So beautifully constructed to really convey the depth of emotion in this story. Well done, guys. Lovely. Absolutely wonderful. Because we have seen so many different kinds of films about this period in time. Quite a few even about certain aspects of the resistance. But you take a totally different tact here. And what you do is you actually make the radio a character. And it, and it truly was. Oh. I mean, it truly was a, a big part of the Allied victory in World War II. So I'm curious how you came up with the story and the approach that you took to hone in on this one piece of communication and how it brought people together on blind faith for the most part because you had no idea whether anybody was listening, but you could only gauge that, it based on what we saw. And that what you just said about not knowing if anyone is listening is really a key feature, both of the film, but also the inspiration for us. Um, at some point, we had heard the story of Charles de Gaulle and the appeal of 18 June, um, which is uh, very succinctly <laughs> Charles de Gaulle. Uh, in England after the fall of France, didn't know what to do, felt directionless, felt helpless. His country had surrendered. It wasn't his country anymore. Um, he went down to the south of England and I believe rented a little radio shack uh, um, and broadcast this really impassioned plea. I had no idea if anyone was going to hear it. I had no idea if it was going to have any effect at all. And actually, historically, we now know that not a lot of people did hear it, but enough heard it that they were able to tune in the next week and the next week. Um, and I think it was something like every Tuesday or Wednesday um, for quite a while that he would return to that radio tower and continue this broadcast. Again, not knowing what effect it was having in his home country um, and not knowing how many people were listening or what they were doing that informa with the information, but he felt compelled to do it. Um, and that is huge for us. That was just so um, impactful. And having seen the film, I'm sure you can see how that easily translates to oh. our character of Jacques, not knowing who's listening or if his words are having an effect, um, but feeling nonetheless the, the need, the real need uh, to do something. That translates perfectly as, your insp as one of your inspirations for this film and this script you know the characters that you give us are such a big part of this film uh, and your casting is just exemplary this is one of jason patrick's best performances as andre you never really know you don't know his motivations you really don't know who he is what he's doing whose side is he on you create this wonderful ambiguity Sebastian, I love Sebastian. I've talked to him many times over the years. I can honestly say this is the most evil character he has ever played. This is worse than his... This, this is even worse than Jerry Jackson General Hospital. So, you know, kudos to you guys. But then you also give us Don Harvey, who is wonderful as Dolman. Because he, and 
the way he plays the character, it's is he really that devoted to the Nazi party? Or is he more devoted to what he can get for himself out of it? The fine wines, the dining, uh, his wife in fancy clothes. Just really fascinating individual character studies we get thanks to your great casting and these performances. Uh, and of course, Judd as Bertrand, just, he is the emotional grounding of this whole film. And yeah. it, it just impeccable. How did you assemble this cast to tell this story? Oh. <laughs> it was a mighty feat. <laughs> He was very much the bedrock. We had uh, a few people come and go over the years as we were trying to get all the right pieces together to where we could finally get off and start shooting. Uh, but he believed in the project from day one, saw how much potential it had and uh, how important the story was. And so he stuck with us from the get-go. Uh, and then after him, uh, we got Carrie. And then that kind of set the ball rolling for them get everything, uh, getting everything else in place to roll. But there was a period of time where we had uh, Matthew Modine attached to play the role of Andre, mm -hmm. uh, but he unfortunately ended up backing out and we uh, replaced him with Jason, which by happenstance, you know, purely, it was just an incredible thing that we managed to get Jason, because you're right, the, the way that he brought so much depth and so much intrigue and uh, just the subtlety of that character is really a testament to what a fantastic job he did with bringing Andre to the screen. Yeah, you... And he saw it from day one. I remember our first meeting with him, and he just immediately knew how to play that ambiguity and how to push it further than we had conceived. And, you know, that's one of the things that we love so much about making films, right, is, is the collaborative process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our favorite actors are the ones who uh, are bringing more than their talent to the table um, and are really collaborating with us and, and can see the story we're trying to tell and, and push it even further. And our entire cast did that with us, which is just, yeah. just so lucky. Uh, you know, absolutely outstanding. But, yes, Jason, this is a tour de force performance for him, in all honesty because of what he does bring, because we don't know, we really don't know where Andre stands and why, and his whys and reasons for doing things until the, the bitter end of the film. But we're not going to divulge that. So, <laughs> <laughs> But so much of this film rises and falls. We've got the emotional grounding, the religious aspect. You don't shove religion down anybody's face. You let Bertrand, without even saying that Bertrand is Jewish, the fact when he rips out the Jewish star that he's had hidden in his pocket, that's all we need to see. But then you have this powerful first act moment with Bertrand and Jacques and their families, Juliet and, and Bertrand's wife, and they're praying. Each is praying to their individual God which really, God is God. Christian God is the same as the Jewish God. Christians just went and added Jesus to the mix. So they're essentially praying to the same God for the same thing. And that is such a powerful moment in this film. In that one moment, all differences dissolve away between these people that are in hiding together. How difficult was it to craft that scene and on paper, but then translate it visually. And this is where your DP, this is where Spencer Hutchins really starts to show his mettle, uh, is with that scene. Talk to me about that, boys. <laughs> well, I have to give credit to Mr. Johnson uh, for, for almost hitting that scene out in one um, on the page. I think uh, uh, often in early drafts, we're alternating scenes before we're kind of cobbling it all together. And I remember Landon turned that in, and we had talked about it. Like, concept I, I don't know whose original idea it was or anything, but, like, I know Landon took the first pass on writing it, and it was just there on the page, um, which is a great place to, to start when you're, intro when you're coming into shooting. Landon, do you want to talk about Spencer? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean it was very much one of those, like, uh, uh, you know, it's not often that inspiration strikes so well that, you know, both of us were in sync. The moment was there. We both went, yep, that's the right thing. Uh, and we have, we've had a number of cast members tell us over the years uh, that their involvement was solidified 
as they were reading the script to when they got to that scene. Mm-hmm. They finished reading it. Well, okay, that's like, I'm going to be involved in this movie no matter what comes for the rest of the script. If um, I... So that kind of gave, gave us uh, an idea of how much uh, care and attention we'd have to give to that scene when we got to it. Um, and we, we were on a very compressed shooting schedule. We only had 17 days to get this entire thing down. Wow. So uh, we very specifically set aside a very precious chunk of time that was much more than would have normally been allocated to a scene of that length. But we knew this scene is so important and so delicate, and we had to get the performances just right, the camera moves just right, give Spencer the time he needed to get all of his lighting put in the proper spot so that we could get this thing just so. Um, So yeah, I remember uh, there's always the worry when you're shooting, even when you're shooting digital and you can kind of see what's going on, that you finish shooting and you're like, oh man, did we get it? Like, I know there was some beautiful stuff in there, but when we cut it together, you just, you have this terror inside of you because you're not positive until it gets cut together, it's going to work. Mm-hmm. And then similar to when we wrote the script, from the pretty early on in the edit, that scene was pretty well put together and just kind of sat there like an anchor as everything else around it shifted and morphed, but it was in a very good spot from the get-go. That is the do-or-die scene for this movie. It really sets the tone, and that is the universality in that moment. And I've got to tell you, Spencer's work, his the, the lighting design in this film is amazing. And as I watch the film, the phrase, light in the darkness with every tonal transition kept popping up because it's really the lighting that is shifting tone for us. We feel the golden warmth of candle and one light in the attic where everyone is hiding. And the way Spencer has lit the attic, especially during that prayer scene, is just amazing, amazing playing with the with the negative space and just getting fringe candlelight on the edges of of the frame stunning when we go outside and we see nazis and the gestapo abounding you get very cold very clinical very harsh lighting we go to andre's office once again it's warm it's welcoming but it's bright as we go to his house And it is totally bright. It's natural. There is hope. There is life. And this, it is the lighting that carries the tone through this film and the shifts, but always reminding us that there is light in the darkness of this war. How did you work with Spencer to develop this visual tonal bandwidth and design the visual grammar to bring it to life? Because this is key. I think for us, you know, an anchor, something that we said to everyone <laughs> over and over and over again, every one of our uh, uh, design team, all of our actors, everyone, is uh, the Francis of Assisi quote that all the darkness in the world cannot ex- extinguish the light of a single candle. And that has been the anchor for so much of our decision making when we approached um, the emotional language of this film, as well as the visual language of this film, which, of course, you know, have to work together. Yes. And so Spencer knew that right away. And we talked a lot about how, particularly early in the film, you know, we wanted this delicate candlelight for Jacques and Bertrand and Juliet's world that, um, you know, we wanted to really represent that that feeling of those, the fragility of that light. Mm-hmm. Um and then that out, when we go outside, that light is actually dangerous. Um, you know, when Juliet is out on the street in the bright light of day, that's when she's in the most danger. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was really important that it felt, you, you know, that it felt colder, um, that it felt more, more sterile and more exposed. We like to play, we play a lot with that in the first part of the film. Yes. And then, you know, even, uh, you know, Andre's office, the first time we're there, should you know, for us, should feel that way too, right? We're not sure if that's safe ground or not. Um, and where does she find safety in the in the office? She finds it in the dark. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, that was a lot of our conversation. We also, you know, uh, uh, Landon and I, were the, like, you know, have a, um, a love of art history, so we talked a lot about, and film history, 
Um, so we talked a lot about like Caravaggio and Chiaroscuro and, you know, really playing with the shadow um, and how we would, you know, really hope to carve that, um, you know, into the film language. Um, and Spencer was with us at every, at every point, every uh, um, moment. Uh, he just really saw, I think, where we were going and had a really brilliant eye for it. Landon, I don't know if you have more. <laughs> uh, I think like a really, uh, like a really good moment that demonstrates how much care and attention to detail he had. We were trying to choose our lens package for the camera, which is a fairly technical detail, right? You try to get mm-hmm. something that's the sharpest, that has the most range for all the various shots that you'd like to get over the course of the film. And we were trying to figure out what was going to be the right thing. We're having a little trouble trying to figure out what was the right uh, feel of all the different uh, options we had available to us. And then he said, "Let me try one more test." And he got a single candle, and he set up the candle, and then he ran through the lens tests again with just that candle as the subject. And immediately we knew, like, based on that, we were like, ah, that's the choice, because of the way that the lens grabbed that light and brought it in and made it feel like you you felt warm just looking at that footage in a way that you didn't with some of the other options available. So, like, that's a really good example of how attentive and intuitive he is with taking his technical expertise and then tying that to the art side and making sure that the emotional uh, response that you're looking for is brought by the choices that you make on the technical side of the craft. Yeah, it's all about the glass. It's all about the glass. What lenses did you end up going with? I ended up going with Leica, actually. Wow. I don't know if you're familiar with them as a manufacturer. Um, They're a very high-end German manufacturer, um, but that's actually one of the things they're very famous for is uh, Leica Glass is a very famous uh, uh, manufacturing. And so uh, the the quality that they bring to it has simultaneously, uh, I don't want to say old-fashioned, but it it has a little bit of that vintage Mm -hmm. sense to it. There's something here you're looking at that is timeless. Yeah, uh, and then the way that they render lights, like I, you'd have to chat with their engineers. They're just brilliant. Yeah, They're, they are they have a well earned and storied history for the way that they handle light with their glass. Oh, absolutely! I chatted with some of their engineers at the NAB convention in Vegas over the years when oh, they de- cool. when they debut. Everybody debuts their new product. Uh, a year or two before it's out, and Leica, it has always been a favorite of mine. Leica, Cook, I think, are two of my favorite lens choices. But for a piece like this, yeah, I think that's absolutely brilliant. Part of what you do here with Spencer, and I'm curious if you did shot listing or storyboarding, especially when it comes to the transitional montages that you put together, because the montages work so well at cutting down on exposition, you don't need it. You let us observe and feel. But I have to tell you, the camera work is just stunning. So I'm curious, did you shot list, storyboard, especially with some of the action sequences that you have, that pepper up in each act? You've got a key action set piece that happens. So I'm curious about that aspect. Uh, we absolutely shot list and storyboard. Um, <laughs> Landon tends to work from a shot list standpoint, but my background is uh, actually in comic books and art department. I've had a number of, I've gotten to play in a lot of modalities of storytelling, um, which I'm very lucky for. Um, so I, I kind of bring that with me and it's a part of the way we work and we kind of work separately and then we compare notes and then, you know, we would do a unified storyboard, which I would draw out and then we bring that to Spencer and you know, often, you know, our, you know, as always, I think, especially with independent film, we are trying to capitalize on something, whether it's time or a really beautiful location like the estate. Um, our storyboards all got thrown out the window when we got the estate uh, locked <laughs> because we wanted to use every inch of that location. Um, but yeah, so 100%, we're shot listing and then we're storyboarding and we're, you know, bringing that to Spencer for their thoughts. Again, um, I know I said this, but we are super collaborative. You know, we want his expertise in the room with us. So, you know, we're always chatting and modifying. And, you know, that the the feedback loop in the creative process kind of never ended for us, which mm-hmm. has been, you know, one of the most, report, uh, most rewarding parts of the project. Well, that's one of the great things is I'm watching some of the action sequences, especially when we're in the estate. That staircase and the landing at the top of it, 
you guys really use that to such great advantage in that third act when we have the dinner party and we've got uh, Captain Jaeger marching in there. We've got the camera up above. We've got bodies mingling down below. It really puts us almost in a hidden kind of mode, such as the resistance is. You're in hiding and you're looking. You're looking down. Nobody can see you there. And that's really a sense that you created. But the camera angles are just outstanding. Some beautiful dutching. Mm -hmm. They're so intentional with that. So the, the ability to lean into that a little bit, you're, you're very astute to notice that we're very intentionally trying to set everything that was what needs to remain hidden upstairs or like the higher up it goes, the more hidden it needs to be. Jacques yes. Being way up in the attic with his own, uh, and then as you descend down into those public spaces, that's where the show happens, where they pretend to be people that they are not. Uh, so it's, it was uh, really delightful to be able to find a place where that, that literal layout of the space and the way that it was built by the architect once upon a time leaned very heavily into what we were trying to do with the story. It works beautifully. And of course, you bookend the film with attics. And both carry very similar meaning in terms of hiding. So I really appreciated that bookending that you do with the attic and, and the radio with the film. But I got to ask you about the dinner scene. The dinner scene... That dialogue, that discussion at dinner, while they're sitting there eating food and you've got a doctor talking about the, the Jews are, they're pigs, they're this, they're that, while people are eating, and it's just so matter of fact in the presentation as he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Captain Yeager, and then, but then we get the slight subtleties of Juliet, of Andre, trying to tolerate while we've got, you're cutting to the kitchen scene with Bertrand about to go ballistic. That whole construct and the, the topic that sets it in motion is just amazing. Did you have any kind of trepidation about that when you were writing it or in how to execute it, particularly when you got to the editing stage? I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's such a, like, centerpiece moment, and we were really, in some ways, kind of hanging our hat as first-time directors on, as to whether or not we could execute that scene. I think it was Jonah, one of our producers, who was like, you guys have to nail this. If we're, we're going to do, I mean, I forget, it was, it's like 15 pages of the script or something like that. You know, it's a huge chunk. Yeah. Um, and we really doubled down on that sequence. Um, so, yeah, we were certainly... Uh, approached it with some trepidation. Um, but also, it felt right. Like, when we came up with it, when we, you know, started thinking about the estate and these fake lives and, you know, what the worst thing that could happen to them there was, the Nazis showing up for dinner and they have to serve them, and then, oh, no, the person who's hunting them shows up for dinner as well, and, you know, really stacking the deck against our characters and ratcheting up the tension, all of those things just started to click into place for us. And then one of the things that we just really believe about creating good villains is that villains always think that they're the heroes, yep. um, but also that they don't necessarily agree. And so we loved the idea of putting two particularly villainous ideologies against each other at this table, and both of those characters think that their response is the right one, and both of them believe that their responses are the most loving one um, <laughs> within a certain respect, and that's what's so monstrous and so horrendous about it, so they both think they're doing something that's right. You know, for Klaus, it's about the glory of Germany and his patriotism, you know, and he, you know, we get a little glimpse into where he came from and what made him the man he was um, and what he suffered and mm -hmm. why he believes so fervently that that must be protected and fought for at all costs. And then we have Dr. Astor, who has this, in his opinion, much soft, softer and much more, you know, palatable, loving approach. And it is equally monstrous. Yeah. Um, so we kind of love the idea of letting them have it out and in the observational nature of the rest of the film as well, letting, you know, kind of forcing our characters, particularly characters who are a little bit more neutral 
um, like Andre, you know, sit there and have to endure that conversation and then be asked to comment on it as well. Dialogue in that sequence is delicious. And they eat it up. Their delivery, they are just eating it up and giving it all they've got. And that's where Sebastian really exudes great malevolence. Uh, just... I mean, he had a grand time. I remember me being like, can you give me two takes of the one about war horses? Because I really want to. I was like, sure, man. <laughs> <laughs> How challenging was the editing? You're working with Dan Wilkin, and he's done some great stuff in tele episodic television. So I'm curious about the editing here, because the pace is so critical. With the big emotional beats that you have, how long were you in editing with this one? Uh, I mean, so, some of that is related to just the process of post um we got somewhat hung up by COVID and all the rest of it, so that kind of you know made some issues with us trying to get through the whole editing process in a smooth uh, fashion. But this scene was very much one where we would pick it up, we'd edit on it for a while, we'd get a feel like, okay, we took a couple steps forward, and then we'd leave, and we'd go do something else, and we'd edit other portions, and then we'd return to the scene and watch it again with a little bit fresher uh, perspective and go, okay, so... The lull there is a little too long, and this is too compressed, and we would kind of massage it out a little bit, feel it, be like, okay, it's about as good as we can get it right now, and we go somewhere else. And then we come back in, and we kept doing that over and over and over again until we had judged it to finally get to the point where each time we would come back and watch it, we'd say, no, that's right. Like, you felt those emotional peaks and valleys that you need in order to build that tension and uh, uh, really let people sit with the tension of it uh, was very important to us. And it, it's been funny to get some reactions from friends. Uh, I've had a number of friends who said, yeah, we got to the dinner scene and stopped like a few minutes in and then like did something else and came back and finished the movie because the tension there was just too much for them to consistently sit through if they had the option of pausing the film and walking away for a sec to kind of calm themselves down. So getting those kind of comments uh, uh, was very gratifying to let me know that we had hit that kind of uh, uh, necessary tempo that was needed in order to shape a person's emotional response to you know, convey the story we wanted to. For most of this film, I was riveted to the point of, I don't even think I blinked dur like during the dinner scene because the tension was so, so rapier. Wonderful. Just amazing. I would be remiss not to mention what is always one of my favorite parts of films, the score. I love what John Snyder does with the score here. What I find particularly interesting is, yes, we get moments of, we get some sweeping motifs popping up in here that you would expect in a film like this. But what took me by surprise was, for example, the 40-minute mark when Juliet walks in the front door of Andre's house, of the estate, for the first time. And the music gets takes on an almost fantasy, almost like a, a disnified Cinderella dream that is so beautiful as the camera is pulling up and going up and going up as her eyes are going higher and higher. And the music swells with that fantasy element. By the same token, we get to the third act. And it is, and the score is subtle, and it's cutting, and you feel it. What kind of discussions did you have with John about the scoring for this film? And yes, I did notice what Klaus likes to play when he wants a musical respite. That was really, really fun that you threw that, you threw that in there. What were you looking for musically with this? Yeah. each character. Uh, so like the timbre of a cello versus a violin versus an oboe are all very unique. And so we had a lot of discussions about what a particular instrument sounds like and what that speaks to the person that it's trying to tie a theme to. So the uh, Jewish couple, Bertrand and Agnes, we used cellos for them because it was a more somber, deeper sound for Juliet. We went with a violin so we could get the kind of more sweeping, hopeful for Andre, we went with mm. oboe and kind of middle woodwinds in order to get some of that unsurety and uh, opaqueness that comes with that sound. Uh, but really the thing that makes John 
so incredible to work with. Uh, he's, he's another one. It's kind of funny. We have a whole series of like, oh, yeah, we've been friends forever. I've known John for a very long time as well. We've been friends since probably seven years old, something like that. <laughs> Quite a long while. Um, but uh, he's what makes him so good as a composer is he knows when music shouldn't be there as right. much as when it should be there. And that's a pretty incredible talent for someone to have and really what kind of sets him apart from some of the other composers I've worked with is that he's as good at knowing when silence needs to be present as when music needs to be there. And so he's not constantly forcing himself into a place he doesn't need to be. And because of that, the moments, like you said, where he can really let it go, where the camera's just moving back, we're finally getting to see Andre's estate. And there's that moment of release after living inside of these boxes and tiny attics and, you know, basements and all the rest of it. You can really let it go. And that letting go feels like it's something because it can be contrasted against the tautness and the sharpness and the silence that comes other places. Mm -hmm. Was this an original composition piece, the uh, Agnes's violin piece that she plays? So Okay, so that was an original piece. That is just beautiful. And that also, that's a beautiful montage segment as we go through the house and start seeing everything that's in the house. And as they start preparing to hide in the open, so to speak, just so a perfect match of visuals and of sound and visuals, just absolutely gorgeous. So now at the end of the day, guys, everybody now gets to see this film. What did each of you take away, learn about yourselves as filmmakers, as directors, in the making of Resistance 1942 that you can now take forward into future films? I've been talking a lot, Matt. I'll let you jump in first. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here. I was hoping you'd jump in first. <laughs> Um, gosh, that is an excellent question. And the lessons that we've learned throughout the eight years that it's taken us to get to this moment have been myriad. Um, and I guess to me, it comes down to maybe, maybe it's this, uh, that we need to hold on to the things that are most critical. We have to identify the things that are the most important as early as we can so that we can hold on to them through the, <laughs> the seemingly unlimited number of uh, challenges, changes, compromises, shifts, other ideas that inevitably come down the process. And because this is collaborative and because this is independent film, those are inevitable. They're a part of the process. And as much as we can, you know, we really want to welcome that in as much as we can and celebrate and, you know, celebrate those opportunities and capitalize on them when they come. But the only way we're going to be able to do that with intention is if we know what we're trying to say, if we know what the heart of our story is, those, those few things which are absolutely uncompromising and are critical. And if we can identify them, then we can be better collaborators and we can better respond to all of the other things, the other ideas, the new locations, the other shifts, like whatever they might be that come our way. So I think that's um, a part of the creative process in general, but is just uh, really paramount in getting this film made um, and will certainly play a part in how we approach the next one. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and uh, Matt, very... Uh, uh, beautifully put the kind of spiritual side of it on a more practical level. I think there's also the element of, uh, there's an affirmation that comes with being able to get this done uh, because it was such a marathon to go that eight years going all the way. Uh, we've jokingly said we uh, tried to cram in all, of, like you hear about all the various things that can go wrong on independent movies and we decided to cram them all into this one movie <laughs> so we could just get them out of the way uh, before we make the next one so that one can be smooth sailing. Uh, so know, knowing that we can be up against uh, all of the things that normally get in the way of a good story being told with, you know, uh, skill and deafness and make our way through that, get across the finish line, get it out in front of audiences, and then be able to receive feedback, both, you know, the positive and the negative, uh, figure out where we need to grow as filmmakers and as storytellers, and then where we can uh, really lean into some of the strengths that we've got and push forward to do the next one. And for our next one, am I going to get a sequel to this and pick up where the story ends? We're, uh, we're, we're jokingly calling it a 
side call. Uh, it's the story of Ramatuel, uh, which is the village that Jacques broadcasts to at the end of the movie. Uh, we won't say more than that for fear that uh, someone hasn't seen the movie yet. If yes. You have, uh, if you haven't, go watch it, listen for when Ramatuel shows up, and know that the story of Ramatuel will be told. Uh, because the minute this ended, it's like, I wanted, I want more. I didn't want to see this story end. So, ah, oh, gentlemen, thank you, thank you so much. This has been so wonderful getting to talk with you this morning about Resistance 1942. I hope we get to chat again in the future about your next project. Us too. <laughs> this has been great. Thank you so much for having us. Oh, my God, an absolute joy. Thank you, guys, and you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, too.